Hello, welcome to episode 135 in this series where I'm programming a, a game for the original NES Live on Twitch. Let's get started. The last time we were on here, we were fixing some of the functionality that had been broken uh, because of changes to the way we were representing entities and sprites. So the entities were uh, broken out into their own thing. The sprites were broken out into their own thing. So we could do things like have the animation of the ship turning there like that. Um, but that, of course, broke um, some of the other stuff in the game. Uh, specifically, it broke the way that the map was working. And that was because the map was only storing information about the entity and not the sprite that's in use by the um, by the entity um, so there were two parts we had to update the spawn point here um, to include now the uh, sprite in addition to the entity so that those could be matched up properly um, and then uh, we had to write the code in the uh, asset tool to um, refactor all that stuff. We changed over all the JSON code um, to parse a little bit more cleanly so that we could bring in these things a little bit more easily. And we are at a point where now we have the game running. It's uh, running through the map. It's loading the enemies correctly with the appropriate sprites and uh, appropriate behaviors, at least as far as they go. There's not a whole lot going on with those um, enemy behaviors. So what I wanted to do today, just kind of briefly, and then talk about, um, talk about kind of some, some of my plans moving forward, because I... We're, we're at a point where we're going to need to do more sort of playtesting where we are introducing ideas into the game and potentially breaking things and then refactoring them. And I want to do some of that stuff um, live. I don't necessarily want to do all of that live, maybe. I don't know. It depends on what people are thinking in terms of what's interesting to them. So you guys can tell me in the comments below what you think in terms of if that's something you actually want to see or not. Um, I'm happy to go through all of that live, um, but you know, maybe that's not as interesting to you as, um, as uh, just kind of seeing the end results of all of that tinkering here, because there's a lot of sort of trial and error that's going to have to happen um, in order to test out these gameplay elements. Um, oh, that was interesting. Why did, why did the player die? Is there some sort of weird transition that he, that it crashed into? <laughs> some sort of random, random bite somewhere that it's crashing into? That's interesting. We'll have to see at some point what that is. Um, but I've spent most of the time up until this point going through... Yes, thank you. I don't care about my GeForce Ready Driver right now. Um, most of this time going through sort of technical aspects of building this game. Um, and I've, as I've alluded to in a number of episodes up until this point, uh, it is increasingly becoming necessary to actually work on the gameplay from the perspective of the gameplay. MDTA UK, hey, how's it going? Um, your chat is in my picture for some reason. I'm going to move that up so that people can actually read that on the recording. Um, have you the ability to create a test environment where tinkering is mainly changing numbers rather than typing out lots of assembly and having to undo things over and over. Well, so you bring up a good point. One of the things we're going to need to do right now is we're going to need to commit the code 
um, in the um, in the repo because uh, we've gotten to a point where the code is fairly stable. I mean, as stable as it's going to be at this point. And uh, to your point, having to uh, type out lots of code and then undo things over and over and hoping that I don't break things in that uh, process is foolish without using the repo to, to do that. Um, as far as specifically just tweaking, you know, numbers, I mean, there are a, a number of, there, there are some possible approaches there, right? So we could do something like uh, what we had been doing early on where we had the script window open and we were doing some scripting. I think this might actually still even work. Um, so, you know, do some scripting where we, it doesn't look like that's the right address stuff anymore, but that's, that's not that important. My point was, um, we could do something like that where we have the scripting running and it can modify parameters that are relevant to the enemies that are, uh, being spawned or potentially some of the other, uh, attributes of how the game will work um, and use scripting to mess with that. I, that's actually a, potentially a good idea, you know, like write some scripting to add enemies onto the screen to play test how they work rather than having to keep going back and forth, adding them into the map and then, you know, coming back. Um, yeah, before committing the values to the ROM, exactly. Um, that's one of those things where I think that will be uh, very helpful to to ensuring that uh, we. I really wish I could get a layout that made a little bit more sense for what I'm doing here, but sorry. Um, yeah, so that would give us some ability to kind of play test it. I mean, there's there's uh, there's also the the opportunity to even write some of the some of the logic of the game in. Lua for the bad guys to test out um, at a higher level before writing even the assembly to do it. I haven't gone through that too much, but it's definitely possible we could, if we think about the way that the, the code structure works today, um, if we go to the main shooter file, we have process, uh, say, Right, we have we have these um, bits of code that look for the type of entity it is, and then we have the different assembler files which have the uh, which actually have the code that that change the behavior of the thing itself. We could write some Lua uh, to script the behavior of all the entities that are in memory that are not um, that are not settled in on yet. So instead of having it be assembly code, this would actually do nothing, and we would have Lua code that looks in the entity list and uh, processes the logic in Lua instead of in assembly. Um, effectively doing the same things like you know, call, going and calling the code here to clear out the object if the object goes off screen or dies or stuff like that. Um, not sure how I feel about that. I mean, writing the assembly to, um, writing the assembly to uh, actually program the behavior of the bad guys uh, in this isn't too difficult. Uh, movement, speed, direction, and math to have radius or curves, etc. to determine behavior. Yeah, I mean, I think those are all things that we could we could write some code to tweak. Um, it, I mean, it could even be just simply tweaked uh, in in memory by, by loading up some RAM with those settings while we're messing around with it. And then, uh, like we were talking about just a moment ago, you know, having Lua call the right code to spawn the enemies and then um, and then use those values in RAM to determine whatever the case may be, the speed, the direction, how it's going to 
how it's going to follow a particular curve. So, but you know, this is to, as I've kind of said a few times now, this is the part that's actually harder, I think, than all of the stuff we've done with everything, you know, surprisingly, I think to, I don't know if it's surprising to anybody, um, or not. It's, um, it's one of those things where I think if you've never actually thought about how to make a game, it's, uh, it might be surprising, but you know, the, the core technical stuff of just building what we've built thus far, you know, for loading the maps and, and whatnot, uh, that part has been relatively straightforward. So, right, this is where the creativity overtakes. Yep, exactly. So, at this point, um, what I'm thinking I want to do... It's funny because um, it, the way that we started with these enemies that will fly out and attack you... Uh, they just fly straight out. I'm thinking what I want to do is start by just, you know, even modifying these enemies to be a little bit more aggressive in their, in their flight pattern. Um, what's funny, what I was getting at was that, um, I should go back to normal speed. That's at maximum speed, normal speed. Uh, what's actually kind of funny is when you play shooters and you, um, and and you know enemy patterns emerge as you as you play and you can memorize them and stuff like that but uh actually making something where the enemy is aggressive enough that it can kill you but not so aggressive that it is an immediate death uh for the player is uh again that's another part of the creativity right because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of nuance there that we can that we can have. So let's let's do this. So I think the first thing I want to do is I want to change those. Um, imagine it will be easy to make those these enemies OP or too clever, overpowered, or yeah, yeah, for sure because. Ultimately, even a CPU like the 6502, which is, you know, massively underpowered by com by compared to t today's standards, you could you could easily make uh, enemies that will uh, just be impossible to um, to deal with. So let's see. So uh, punch out design their enemies as almost like a performance with timings yeah yeah in that sense it's almost like a rhythm game uh to to a certain extent which is why and it's so exacting that's why um it's really difficult to play when you're not on a, a crt because modern displays introduce enough lag that the timing is just ever so slightly off in some cases and and you you know you just have a hard time have a hard time playing. Like I know a lot of people who are into that game <clears throat> claim that they can't, you know, they can't beat Mike Tyson. Now the text is scrolling off the side. They can't beat Mike Tyson um, in that game uh, or the final boss of that game if, uh, there, that's better. If uh, they're not playing on something like an analog machine or a CRT, because the timings are so uh, so off compared to uh, compared to a CRT, so sorry, I keep messing with the layout <clears throat> while we're talking and while I'm doing this, but it's just uh, I don't know what happened between when I was streaming last year and this and and now the the text layout is kind of not the same way it was so it's inter the the background is interfering with um with the text all right so this thing is literally just incrementing the y position and then it's checking to see if we if it gets to f0 and uh if it's not equal it will let's see if it's not equal it will 
check the player. Okay, checks if it collides with the player. And then if it's zero, it will skip. Otherwise, it will. So I guess that means that if it was zero, it collided. We can look this up because I don't remember what this does. Non-zero. Okay, so yeah, that's what I thought. So if uh, if we get a zero, it jumps. Otherwise, we handle. We handle. We we'd put a counter in for um, for groups of enemies, for waves of enemies. I play <laughs> software updates. Yeah, it's possible. I was just trying to go through zero page the zero page episodes and um, re-export them without the background music because I've gotten a number of people who have complained about the the background music um, in them and. Um, for whatever reason, Premiere will not load episode two, uh, which is really frustrating. So I may have to, but but in loading episode three, I realized that I, I mixed the audio separately from the video. So the, the audio is just one, it's just one track. It's not the, it's not the, the voiceover and the audio. Um, so, I should be able to just down, um, just re-export my voice and then uh, update the video by just swapping, swapping the voice in. We'll see. It may not be quite that simple. Some of the other episodes work okay, but it's still quite a pain that it, it it's not consistent. So we could, in theory, do something a little bit more interesting with this enemy. Um, right now, just flying straight down is, is pretty pointless. Um, one thing I also would want to do, just for the sake of our sanity when testing this, I'm going to move this a little bit lower so that it is... Um, going to launch a little bit more quickly than it has been. <clears throat> and then we'll re-export that. <clears throat> Wait, did that give an error? No. Okay. Oops. Ended up started later, later than I wanted to because um, because I was on a Zoom call that just was way longer than it needed to be, but there wasn't much I could do about that, so just needed a little bit of time between that wrapping and and starting this to be able to come to this and be a little bit coherent. Let's just make sure that this actually still spawns. It should it just should be like right about here now. Right? Yep, there it is. Okay, cool. So let's uh, let's do this. What I want to do is I think I want to make them travel in a sort of basic sine wave um so just you know alternating left and right relatively smoothly um there's a couple of challenges with that in so far as how that would work the first is we we're not going to use actual any sort of actual function to calculate uh, this, the, the amount of movement using the sine function because one, there isn't one in the 6502. It's not like built in to the CPU. 
um, two to actually calculate it for real is is uh, pretty slow and expensive uh, even on DOS machines you know x86 machines um, you know while they were in the 100 to 200 megahertz range it was still considered pretty slow to do that um, and so generally you'd use uh, lookup tables where you would have the you you'd say okay this is this is my angle in sign what is the what is the value coming back and it would return back uh, that lookup and of course that comes at the expense of space and there's some tricks that you can do to um, save space I don't really care about saving space right now because we're potentially going to be using a cartridge that's uh, 512k I don't know we'll see but that's really not um, of concern right now um, ramping up a value maybe a multiplier for a duration then when it matches the max value it goes down um, yeah you could do something like that but then you'd end up more with like a zigzag kind of line line pattern going back and forth i mean it would effectively uh, achieve the same result but it would not be as uh, smooth as an actual sinusoidal is that how you say that <laughs> sinusoidal uh, curve pattern going down the screen um, so what we want to probably do is well there are a couple of things so the first thing is like I was saying that we have to have a lookup table for the sign the second thing we would need to do is the X position right now is just X the you know it's just a, uh, um, a whole number and so because it's just a whole number we have a problem with using uh, sine cosine those sort of things which yield fractional values because we don't have any sort of floating point or whatnot uh, in the game uh, or on the 6502 so we would be using something like uh, fixed point math where we're essentially losing some um losing some accuracy in what we can represent in the x direction for the sake of being able to uh well that's not that's not exactly true we we use a secondary value to represent the decimal number of uh what the x position currently is and then rounded essentially to the nearest whole number um could you round up the values maybe code it in c and spit out a value array um yeah i mean so that's essentially what we're taught it's not so much rounding out as what you'll do what you end up doing is um kind of multiplying the value to make it shift the relevant values into a range that works for uh works for what you're doing so let's say we have um sign of uh 45 is going to be what 0 0.707 or whatever it is we have right so obviously that's less than one um we can't store that directly as is in the 6502 because we don't have um we don't have the accuracy to do that and we don't have the floating point uh, hardware to do that uh, so what typically ends up happening is you use uh, you use a um, I'm trying to think what's the right what's the best way to do something like this we we could the, the maximum value we'd be able to represent in the in one of the bytes is is 70 uh, 707 is obviously too too high um, if we if we were to 
It's been a while since I've done this. So the way the way that I remembered this kind of working, but I'm not sure. We'll have to we'll have to see how we want to do this here. The way that I remember it um, from long ago. This, the way I have things set up right now is a little bit cramped with uh, everything here. So, um, you know, normally, let's say you have a 16-bit number. Right? And this represents just a whole number. And we want to represent decimal numbers. But we don't want to use actual decimal numbers or floating point because it's too slow. So what you would do is you could divide up the number into sort of like 8 and 8. Um, and uh, what you do is you say, okay, I've got, this is my whole number part and this is my fractional part. Um, the part that I'm drawing a blank on is I feel like what you do, I feel like when you're working on it, so let's, let's, let's take an example here of, you know, if we have the value one. We'll just keep it simple for the sake of my my tired brain right now. And what you would want to be able to do is you'd want to be able to do things like, you know, divide one by by two. Um, and I'm picking two because I want to be able to use a bit shift um, to everything has to be done by bit shift to be efficient. And so what that would mean is that then you have, you know, um, that one bit gets shifted out of this, this, these eight bits and the one gets shifted into these lower eight bits. And then, so this represents a half. Um, and then I believe that this is a quarter and then a, a 16th and so on. So you can make some fractional values out of um, out of those numbers, you know, using using this method. And so so what you would do is you take a how does this work? So when you get the sign value, like we have 0 You just multiply it by 256, and then that whatever that value is is the approximate representation of the sine value. So that would give you. Let's just say. I mean, and all this would get pre-calculated and then and then used. Um, and then you know stored for later use. So if we multiply that by 256, not trigonometry, just equals. We get 181, and then the fractional part is gone. And so, if we go to programmer view for a second here, if we look at the 181 in decimal. I mean, sorry, in binary. You have a half, and. A sixteenth and a thirty second. Let's say we'll just use the first four values there. So what is that? That's um what's one sixteenth? That's not gonna work in this view. Six two five plus point two five plus point five point eight one two five. So the thing is, of course, by doing something like this, your the range of values that you can represent, you know, um, is limited, uh, and so you're going to have a you're going to have a um, only so much accuracy in doing that. And that's true with, with, um, 
floating point as well, right? Like standard floating or double point uh, values. There, there are only certain numbers that they can actually represent uh, accurately. And so, um, you know, when you're working with those kinds of numbers, especially if you're doing some sort of scientific calculation, you have to understand what the limit, the limits of the, um, the limits of the representation are in order not to have values and results that are inconsistent or don't make sense uh, once you've gone through them uh, because the the loss of accuracy can happen uh, at multiple points in your calculation resulting in, in numbers that don't make sense. Like it's not that uncommon that you see someone who doesn't understand how uh, numerical types work in languages that are more type strict doing something like they'll do they'll be working with integers and they'll do you know a number divided by another number times another number to get an average like you know if they have like a if they've summed up a bunch of values and they do 486 divided by, and let's say there are a lot of points that they added up, so they divide by like a thousand, right? And so the value would be 0.486, except they're working with integers. Um, you know, um, so so the so the problem with that is, or actually, or a percentage, right? If they're working with a percentage, that's maybe this is maybe a better example. So. Um, you know, 486 is obviously 48.6% uh, of a thousand. Um, but the thing is that they'll do the 40, the the number divided by the the total, then times a hundred. Because you know, in normal math, when you're thinking about it, you can do that and not have to worry about it. But in if you're working with an integer value, you have to do you know 46 times a hundred divided by a thousand. Um, you know, with with this scientific calculator, it doesn't matter. But when you're doing it here, if I do 46 divided by a thousand, you get zero times a hundred, you get zero, right? Which is totally wrong. Versus 46 times a hundred divided by a thousand, and then you get 48, and it's rounded to, um, you know, it's it's truncated down to 48, which is more accurate than than zero, certainly. But you see that kind of stuff all the all the time because people don't understand how the the different uh, numeric types work. Um, uh, so you got to be careful with that kind of stuff. Um, is that really the so going back to what we were saying before? Um, Seven oh seven times two fifty six. Sorry, 0 0.707. 0 0.707. Yeah, gave us 180. And then I was sort of working backwards from these numbers. I guess, I mean, it is relatively close, right? You're getting point, what it was like 0.8 something. It's, it's certainly nothing I would want to use um, to do any sort of accurate math where we really care about the values, but um for the purposes of what we're doing for just drawing uh you know uh, an enemy moving along a curve that that should be fine so then the question becomes does that affect the carry flag well it does i mean so what we what effectively we'd be doing is let's say Let's say we're doing this method and we have we're we're incrementing through we don't want to represent sign with all like you could imagine where we would have a lookup table for three hundred and sixty values of sign, right? From zero to three hundred and fifty nine and then three sixty is the same as zero, so there's no point in uh representing that. So uh and each of those values, as we go through them, uh, we, we add them 
so you know we add the value of sine at zero uh, at zero is zero and then the value of sine at one is whatever it is and then at two it's whatever it is and you keep adding it to you know kind of track the enemy slight ever slightly to the right until you get to the point where the enemy position is offset by um by one for the for what is that for 90 degrees right um, and then swings back the other way. Um, as we would want to add that in to the player's X position, uh, yes, it could affect the carry flag because you could potentially have... Thinking about the way that we're going to do this, I'm thinking about the way we're going to do this, so bear with me for a second as I as I kind of talk through it and think about it at the same time the i think the x position we would have like a fixed x position that they would kind of track almost like its axis like if you if you had an x y axis but you turned it around like um how screens work um where there is uh, an axis that the um the enemy is traveling upon um, so if we, if we draw our screen here, you know, the enemy is traveling upon this axis and essentially oscillating in a sine wave. Up. Uh, we don't actually have to do, we don't actually have to do any real adding or subtracting of Is that true? I mean, I guess if we were adding the fractional, I mean, so to, to answer your question specifically, yes, it does, if the carry flag does get affected because as you add fractional amounts, you are gonna get a carry on that byte and that will carry over to the, uh, the, the whole number byte, so if you were to look at this example here where you have this eight bits representing a half and these eight these eight bits representing zero if you were to add two 16-bit numbers like this at the time um well, let's say they're two 8-bit numbers because if they're just 16 it just happens automatically so you add this together to itself this becomes zero and the carry is set and you have to put the carry into here right and this becomes one now and that makes sense because a half added to itself is one it's a whole one right and that works for that works for all of these where if you have a quarter and you add a quarter to it it goes over to a half and then you add another quarter and that gives you three quarters, right? And then you add another quarter and that um, gives carries over to this and then that sets the carry flag, which then gives you the whole. So it's just like standard binary. Um, the only difference is that this is kind of going backwards um, from if compared to the, this thing here, which totally works. Um, or it's not even really backwards because it's still going in order of ascending uh, magnitude, right? Um, it's just when we think about it, because it's a fractional amount, it's it's almost like it's going backwards where you're now, instead of going doubling in size as you move to the left, you're halving in size. Uh, every one is yet another half of the thing as you, um, as you travel to the right along the bits in that byte so um but like i was saying thinking about the way that we would do this we would probably just want to have a core x value that we offset with every cycle based on the sine wave so we don't have to do do we want to do it that way where we we're Because if we don't do it that way, 
let's say we have an, an x value that the player that the enemy is traveling along and we add i guess it doesn't matter i mean effectively you're normalizing for if you if you don't do it that way if you don't keep the if you if you if the pl enemy is traveling along a local x axis essentially you're normalizing that to be your your zero your origin on the x axis of the screen um or you could just say we're just adding to the actual x coordinate directly i'm not sure which will be better I guess you could even add more dynamic movement by combining sine wave on the y axis with something like square wave on the x. I mean, you could, I, I don't even want to get into that right now because um, right now I just want to make a simple sine wave pattern work. Um, you could, I mean, you could do another, you could do other stuff like what, you know, you were talking about uh, configuring things through lua or something like that so instead of um being at a fixed um magnitude where we just take whatever the sine value is and multiply it by two and that's our value that we're offsetting in the x uh with every cycle um and we'll get back to that uh what happens at each cycle in a second you could have some sort of uh, way of adjusting that magnitude to be you know two or three or five because remember if you take if you take a sine wave there are two a couple things you can do if you have a sine wave and uh take your uh angle what is that theta and multiply it by something here that's the frequency and then if you multiply it on the outside that's the magnitude so we could do something where we could make this oscillate even more where you have tighter sine waves apologize that my drawings are terrible this evening um, or we could control is it a tiny little variation along that or is it a big swooping, very far, you know, out um, movement to the point where we could even, you know, it might even cross over the boundary of the left hand side of the screen. And then do we care about that or do we let it pop up on the right hand side? Like we have, I've seen that in other games like Crisis Force, right? Um, so there's a lot of options there. And then if you increase the magnitude by a substantial amount, you probably want to increase the Y um, speed so that it's an actual smooth movement because if you don't do that, then you'll just end up with these very, depending on your frequency and what the frequency means for the screen, you'll end up with these very wide motions, which... I don't know how much that actually makes sense for the game. It's all math and numbers. So the Lua could control it. Yeah, it, it could. The APU is too busy doing audio. There's no way to use those. No, the, the, those APU channels, um, that's an interesting idea. Uh, but those APU channels, they're generating their... You know, they're not generating number counters that you can actually look at um, and control in the sense of, in the sense of, you know, using that as your sign generator for this code. Um, but uh, that's, yeah, that's an interesting idea. I've never actually heard of anybody suggesting something like that. But um, the other thing that we haven't talked about is how many values we actually want to represent um, for the sine curve, because like I was getting at earlier, we could have, uh, you know, all 360, we could say, you know, if we, if we have our sort of standard model of a sine curve here, let me see if I can attempt to do this in a, can I do a straight line? Is that not possible? Okay, I thought maybe I could do. You have a standard sine wave here, right? If we think back to uh, basic trigonometry, 
that's 180 degrees here. Um, and so we could divide up this sine wave in any number of segments that we want to traverse. We could do all 360. We could say, you know what, I don't care about that. I just want uh, one, two, three, four, five sample points along the sine wave, which means that all we're going to have are 0, 1, 0, negative 1, and 0, which isn't going to lead to a very smooth wave. So we, we could even do something where, you know, if there, this was a more power, powerful machine, we could use non-whole uh, non number increments along the sine wave and get really, really small fractional values to get even more fine motion along the curve. Um, but of course, at the expense of the cost of computing that and storing um, that information for use later. Uh, slower the movement speed, the more detail you'd need, right? Yes, uh, I mean, yeah, like kind of like audio. Yeah, in, this, in the sense that if we, w the smoother we want it to be, there, there's, got, there's gonna be a sweet spot of how much of the sign information we need to store versus um, um, uh, versus our actual speed on the screen. And yeah, sampling audio is a good um, is a good analogy to that, like the the Nyquist theorem theorem of of um, or the Nyquist fre frequency of like if the if you have a, a an audio frequency um, that you want to record, there's a a specific sample rate that you have to sample at in order to guarantee that you will capture all the all the audio. So for capturing up to 20 hertz audio, um, uh, wait, is it 20 hertz? 20 kilohertz audio, right? Because human audible range is 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. You have to sample at twice the sampling rate. So you have to sample. That's why we chose you know that's why audio is recorded good quality audio is recorded at 44 kilohertz at least if not more uh, some places um, some people will record in 48 kilohertz and sample down some uh, most recording studios probably sample at you know 192 kilohertz um, to capture as much audio as they can and then of course they down sample to um, a um, a frequency that makes sense for CD quality audio. Um, that's why that I mean, and it's not it's not. Uh, that's why I hesitated when I said theorem because I don't think it's a theorem. I think it's actually proven that uh, that that works, and it's and whatever audio is occurring within that frequency range is is guaranteed to be captured, which is why. Um, if you are recording something, um, the digital recording of it, provided that all you care about is the audible range of of what our ears can hear, then digital audio is perfectly fine and you don't need analog recording equipment um, in the sense of like recording to tape and vinyl and stuff like that. I mean, there are, there are other possible effects those additional sounds might have. Um, on what we're hearing, but um, generally speaking, you probably can't even hear. Uh, you definitely can't hear the other frequencies, and I, I, everything I've read has said that it's questionable that those other frequencies have any sort of meaningful interference with the audio that we're listening to. Um, and that's especially true of um, albums that you buy today that are either remastered digitally or um, recorded digitally. Um, the fact that they are recorded digitally and then pressed onto vinyl is, is sort of hilarious. Um, you know, at that point it's like you're buying it cause it's cool. And then, you know, keep, keep in mind, this is the guy that bought the project blue soundtrack on vinyl. So I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I, I, I like records just as a medium because they're interesting, um, but to say that they have superior audio quality in this day and age where nobody is using fully analog setups to 
properly produce these uh, recordings is uh, is a little bit silly. So, all right. So here we are talking about audio recording um, because we're talking about sine waves. So how do I want to do this? How do I want to let's let's start off with something really. Um, no, it's okay, Martin. It's <laughs> you don't have to apologize. It's a good tangent. I mean, it's it's actually um, it's all relevant. It's all um, you know, it's all uh, connected. Um, and that's the thing that people like. That's what that's what I love about electronics and software and computers is that you know all of these things fit together. And if you understand all the different aspects of it, like they make sense, right? So understanding how this works and how sampling works when doing just a basic sine wave for enemy movement in this game um it helps shed light on you know how sampling how digital audio sampling works and why having something like 8-bit you know uh, 8-bit samples versus 16-bit samples versus 24-bit samples um, can make a difference and then you know the sampling frequency like we were talking about like you mentioned it's like if you wanted it to be really smooth well then you have to have more data which is essentially the sample rate but you know at the same point it's like if we only care about it moving uh in a in a motion that's pretty crisp and um you know and uh not particularly smooth and um fairly low frequency across the screen then we don't need a sample rate that's quite so high so we don't have to store as much data um you know and that totally relates to audio so it's it's a it's a again a useful useful little tangent and, and interesting uh nonetheless so what i'm, I'm thinking i want to do what i kind of want to do is i i'm i'm almost thinking i want to just to find some basic like very raw data here for for our motion and then we'll just kind of and minimizing cpu cycles required to plot the new pixel coordinates yeah yeah um i mean when you think about it the fact that the nes is somewhat contem contemporaneous with a um you know a cd player uh in the 80s is pretty amazing the the amount of um the amount of advancement in technology that had to be made to make digital audio work um compared to the nes you know sample digital audio where cds actually sounded really good um it's pretty amazing um because the nes on the other hand is like really basic um, um, so let's call this a uh, little bit movement for lack of a better name. <clears throat> and what we're going to just do is we're going to, we're going to define days of a math coprocessor. Yeah, exactly. Um, now you have, now you have dedicated vector units that can do, you know, simultaneous, uh, simultaneous operations across uh, you know, m multiple vectors in, in a, in a single clock or, or set of, you know, a, a few, a few clocks on the CPU. Um, whereas here, you know, just doing a, having a built-in multiply instruction was too slow. Um, so what I'm thinking I want to do is I want to kind of have, We have a couple of options. We have the option to, yeah, GPUs are, um, well, they're floating point calculators, yeah, and 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 um, and and the fact that you know now that you can use them for uh, general purpose computation, and you know they're used for Bitcoin mining and uh, and um, artificial intelligence and stuff like that it's just it's crazy the the stuff that people are building in hardware is pretty amazing um all right so if i wanted to make this work where it moved in a pretty smooth 
motion. We could spend some time writing a... I guess we could do that relatively quickly. No, if we know what our magnitude is going to be. Let's let's just talk about how we would do this, and then we'll probably just hand encode the bytes. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what this is. I'm almost afraid to open it without knowing. I guess I was testing out how fast uh, Hello World prints. Okay. Don't care. Um, I don't know why I was doing that or what that's from, but... Um, so what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to calculate... We're going to use a relatively low sample rate. And, and what I want to do is I just want to say, okay, if our value starts at uh, an angle of zero and it's got to be less than 360, and let's say I just want 15 points, we'll add 24 with each loop, right? Um, and then we're gonna we're gonna make it have a swing of about ten pixels as our as our magnitude off uh, the axis, and so then what we'll do is we will um, I don't have we'll just need to make sure to truncate this. Um, so I times uh, 3.1415, wasn't it 3.14159? That's close enough. Divide by 180. Um, I don't need that. So we're, do, we're converting degrees to radians. Um, if you've never done it before, I assume some of you have, but um, just times by pi and divide by 180. And then you can do the opposite to convert radians to degrees, you multiply by 180 and divide by pi. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to multiply that by 10. And then we'll just truncate that. Um, I'm just going to round. That's a good that's a good, good question. I was just going to truncate, but you bring up a great point, which is that that's going to produce an inconsistent, um, an inconsistent result potentially. Will it? Well. Now nah, it should be okay. If I'm just truncating on both sides, it should be all right. Because, I mean, you figure if you get 8.7 on one side and you get negative 8.7 on the other side, you know, it's still 8 and negative 8, which is the same. If I were to round to, if I were somehow doing it where it was rounding up to 9, but then truncating the negative 8.7 to negative 8, um... I think we're okay with just doing a truncate. Um, and then... So those are our values. And you can see that like a sine wave, they go up and down and negative and back. So you have 0, 4, 7, 9, 9, 8, 5, 2, negative 3. So, and these are all... Is that uh, Dolores MS Dolo DX? Uh, let's get the. Um, we'll plug those in. Hello, how are you? You're joining me on a. Uh, I'm not sure this is going to be the most exciting stream. I know your your sister's been doing uh, streaming. 
but she does the fun side of the game stuff. She she's well, this is fun too. But she's doing um, she she gets to play games and uh, and uh, saw some of her reaction videos uh, for I forget what it was she was playing, but it was one of those horror survival games that I can never play because they scare the crap out of me. And uh, yeah, and so uh, saw that she was she was playing one of those. It was pretty pretty entertaining for her uh, to see her reaction. This is this is just me programming, so it's not quite as exciting. Um, oh, I can't play those games, you know. And I even I I bought um, Bioshock, um, the Bioshock Collection, which by all accounts that game is really good, and um, I. I just, I don't know, like I started playing it and I, I couldn't get past the beginning. Just, it's so damn creepy. So, I'm a huge baby when it comes to that, too. Um, Alright, so now we need to... Yeah, exactly, the music and the noises are... Um, are, are definitely like they do a g great job in some of those games setting the uh, the ambience uh to really freak you out like even um what game uh uncharted 2 um where there's a, a part dead by daylight yeah there's a part in uncharted 2 where they're in south america and and there's some i i don't want to say because it's like spoilers although that game has been out for forever but um so they uh they're they're in a part and it gets creepy and it that I playing that at three in the morning was a bad idea. Um so I need to convert my um negative values and I'm always really terrible at this um with binary. Um but this is gonna help me out here. So Let's see, so that's one 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 oh one. Oh, except I'm in decimal right now, that doesn't work. Um yeah, I saw that she was streaming um just randomly. I guess on Instagram she had posted it and I was like, Oh, I had no idea she was doing that. So that was kinda cool to see. Um I can't remember the last time I've actually seen both of you in a long time it's been crazy between just life how uh, it uh, sweeps you away for yeah yeah exactly sweeps you away for for uh, well thank you it's been uh, it's been interesting hopefully you guys are staying safe and uh, and uh, doing all right during these crazy pandemic times. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that uh, that's all been working out well for you guys. Yeah, we've actually been okay. Um, I've been doing this for a while, working on this project, just kind of um, both as a learning thing for people and also to work on this for a while. But um, but been b busy with work, and then I recently changed um, jobs about a month and a half ago for 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 good reasons. So I'm pretty pretty excited about that and then um and it's been going well and then uh yeah just trying to stay safe um yeah martin i know i saw that they you're doing another lockdown um it's it's crazy like it's um the this whole virus thing is just in, uh, scary and uh we know people who have had it and had mild, you know, mild symptoms. You'd, you'd never know that they had it if it hadn't been, you know, such a big thing for for how it affects some other people. Um, 
I'm going to apologize, by the way, for anybody who's watching this and going, how, why the hell is he converting these negative numbers this way? I honestly am really bad at this. Let me see if there's a thing that will let me do this in a little bit more quickly. Um, convert negative to binary, um, because I am terrible at this, and... The calculator seems to be the easiest way to do it while I'm talking and not trying to uh, mess this up. So, I don't know. There, there's probably a better way and someone will yell at me in the comments on the recording uh, later, but oh well. Um, yeah, so this is two's complement um, math. Uh, Martin so what's happening is because we're dealing with um, here I'll show you an example we've talked about this I think before on the stream but um, it's worth showing again so if you have minus if you have one in binary that's just one right if you have minus one you go well how do I represent them that in binary believe it or not it's the same value as 255 which is just FF right Oh, you're saying you're saying ff minus the value, or you are you telling me how to do it faster, or are you asking? <laughs> I'm gonna keep recapping though because it's worth it for for people who don't necessarily know this or remember. Um, so if you have 255, right, um, which is ff, and then you add one to it, you're gonna get well. In this case, it gave us 256 because it's not 8 bit, but if you were using just eight bits, you get zero um, because it would it would um, overflow. And so it's essentially the equivalent of adding negative one and one, getting zero, right? Um, but actually um, thinking about that, that means that I should be able to take these values and, um, and just kind of work backwards from it. <clears throat> um, But anyway, so I was getting, I was saying about the, um, the pandemic stuff, uh, you know, we've been very lucky. I've been very fortunate with everything going on with work and, um, and my daughter's school is still open full time. They have had a couple of cases, um, unfortunately, and, you know, and they're quarantining classes off as a result of those cases. And so it's like, you know, at what point do we say, we were just talking about this, at what, what point do we say, you know what, like, we're literally just playing the lottery here. <sighs> playing the lottery here, trying to, um, trying to stave off the odds that, you know, nobody in her class, let's say best case scenario, you know, nobody in her class gets it. Um, she's, she's in the only class that, um, that doesn't get it, which is unlikely. Um, more likely somebody in her class will, will definitely get it. And, you know, and then the question is like, is it going to be her? And is there going to be any effect of that? Like, is it going to, because that's the thing is that people don't really understand what the side effects are of getting it. We know that some people get it and they're fine. And that's what I was saying before. We knew, we know people who had it, they tested positive and they had it for, you know, a week or more. And then it was, that was it, you know, and they maybe had a fever one day or, you know, two days and, and like a mild cold and it was no problem. And, you know, um, but we also know that there are, even if you don't believe for some reason, the, the numbers that are being posted of how many people have died from it, there are a substantial number of people who have died from uh, being infected because of its effect on whatever uh, underlying conditions you have. And you can't say that just because you had an underlying condition that it exacerbated that that's not, um, you know, death by coronavirus. So it's like, it's crazy. It's just, it's, it's really... Um, it's really hard to know how to navigate. Right. Yes. Yes. I did see that too. It's so uh, weird and scary. I'm sitting right. Yeah, I know. I, yeah. So I'm just curious to see because you, you know, you're, I assume you're in your school too. Um, 
Loris, uh, you know, every day. And so you're interacting with people and students and, and then, right, your kids too. Um, oh, you're actually teaching from home. Well, I know, I know. I mean, I understand hating it. I mean, right. I've been, I've been working from home now since March. Um, part of, part of the reason, I, I mean, I, I like being in the office, so I like being with people. I don't necessarily like working from home all the time. It's nice on, you know, days where the traffic is bad or the weather is crappy, but you know, um, but it's hard. It's hard being home. Um, I didn't realize he taught also. So he's, oh man, he's in the city full time. That's, uh, that's, you know, and that was one of the things where we were like, we were glad that, that we weren't in the city anymore. Although, I mean, you know, it's like at that point, it's like if you were on the subways and stuff like that, that's how that was getting spread. There's no, there's no question about that. And so if you're, as long as you don't do that, which I know being in the city, it's like, it's hard not to, but, um, but it's not unavoidable. It's not unavoidable. So if you're, if you're not, um, on the subways or something like that, you can, you can be okay, but it's still hard. I mean, the whole situation is obviously difficult and, um, nobody seems to really know what to do. Um, we know some of the things not to do. Um, we didn't do those things, though, unfortunately. And so, yeah, it's amazing. Actually, uh, so many people from New York City um, have moved out uh, onto Long Island. Um, uh, it's like the there are a bunch of people who are um, selling their homes here that are getting immediate offers and uh and even more than what they they were asking for and uh because people don't want to be the people who can afford to you know are are moving out of the city not everybody is and and some people don't want to i mean it's um it's still it still seems like there's a lot going on, but I, I'm sure it's way less busy than it was. I mean, even the place I'm working for now is in the city and they are, um, they don't have any, they don't have any plan to send anybody back, uh, into the city anytime soon. Yeah, no, I know Be being as close to the city as you are, um, I, I, th I imagine it's worse for you, um, but even out east, m you know, more east where we are, it's pretty crazy. Um, all right, so I typed out these values for the, the bytes here. Um, we have, uh, let's see, how many do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So we have our 15 here. Um, and so we're just going to cycle through these, I think we need to, we need a timer of some sort to, um, or some sort of index to cycle through these. Um, I mean, it's good for all the people who want to leave New York and we know, we know people who want, who want to get out of here because the taxes are so high and, uh, and, uh, you know, and so they are, um, they're thrilled because they sell their house for a good, a good price, better than what they were hoping for. And then, you know, they go to Florida or North Carolina or something like that. But I wouldn't want to be in any of those states right now with the way that the virus is moving. Uh, although, uh, you know, if you had asked me at the beginning of this, if I had been, if I would have been worried about Ohio, I wouldn't have, but they've been the worst so far in, um, in uh you know in the country in in some regards at this point they they keep breaking records for how many um how many uh infections are are reported daily and the only reason i know that is because um i don't know if any of you follow um what's his channel is it 8-Bit Duke? If you don't, 
If you don't follow the 8-Bit Duke on YouTube and watch him streaming, you're you're missing out. He's got great videos, um, although he's not uh, he is has not posted quite a bit in in a while. Um, but he streams sometimes, and and he's in Ohio, and and he's got um, he keeps re retweeting um, these numbers. Um, trying to convince my parents to finally sell my childhood home. Yeah, you know, and, and I bet you they'd, they'd do all right if they sold that. It's in a good spot, you know, it's close to stuff and, um, and, uh, they could probably do all right there. Um, and they're still out on the West Coast, right? My, my sister's out there too with her boyfriend and they're just kind of still keeping a low profile um all right so what am i doing here i can't type tonight all right so there's our energy there's the timer thing i'm not using it anywhere Okay, so we'll use the timer as our offset into this array. Um, what I actually want to do is, that's why I was counting how many of these we had, because I need to do a modulo and properly truncate. Should have thought of that before, I suppose. If we do 360 divided by 16, Really, what did I do? What was I? 18 sample points. How did I end up with? Oh, because zero, I guess. Well, I guess I can include zero. You know what? I don't care about these numbers so much right now as I just care about making this part function and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, we can tweak these as we go. Okay. Um, still in Cali. They came to visit a little while ago while the numbers were low and their state was off the list. <laughs> I hope your sister's good. Yeah, she's she's doing good. Um, she's doing okay. Yeah, her boyfriend is uh, working. They, they're actually busier than ever and stuff. So, But uh, thanks for popping in. Good to hear from you. I'm glad, I, glad you guys are doing good. Uh, one of these days I'm going to actually pop into your sister's streams and say hi. Um, but, uh, yeah, thanks for visiting. Uh, all right. So the timer hopefully gets initialized to zero coming into this. I guess it doesn't really matter. What we want to do is yeah that would be great it would be great to get together in real life seems like a weird thing these days but uh yeah and there, while the weather is still good that would be fun we can do something outside so yeah talk to you later um so i'm gonna be wasteful here and I'm going to load the exposition into we'll do this we're going to assume that the x velocity has has the x value in it. Um, how is it going to know? How is it going to do that? That's a good question. I guess um, we'll load we'll load it with this and we'll say okay, if it's um if it's 0 then we don't want to do that. Or if it, 
Uh, hold on. If it if it's if it's if it is zero, we're gonna skip that, and instead we're going to. The, the thinking being that if X is zero for some reason, then uh, it, I mean the the enemy shouldn't be at the zero position on the screen. Is my thinking that may have to change? This is more th more so for proving the point. Um, we'll see if any of this works. <laughs> Um, so if it's that, um, otherwise we will, otherwise here, what we'll do is we'll load We'll, we'll put the um, the X position in the X uh, velocity, which we're not using for um, the little bit um, enemy because we do not uh, need to. And so we're going to use that to store the X position. And we're just going to assume that if it's zero, that it hasn't been initialized yet. So we should do that. Um, if it isn't zero, we will... Um, we will store that value into the exposition to reset it for the ad that we're going to, going to do here in a moment. Um, so once we've done that, what we want to do is we want to load a uh, no, that's okay. A little bit movement. Y. I want to load Y with uh, objects timer. And we'll load A with that, and then we will clear our carry, and we will add with carry objects enemy X position X, and then we will store that back into the X here. Um, this is going to get a little bit There may be a problem with what we're doing here. Um, I have to think it through to know if that's actually true or not, but we'll we'll see. Um, so we clear the carry, we add the carry, and then we store it. So we've got our X position now updated, and then um, we want to increment the timer, and then we increment the Y position, and we load it, and we check. So that's basically the idea my guess is this is going to be horribly wrong and broken because i was not sure of what i was doing and also having a conversation at the same time so that should be uh interesting uh what is the problem range error a little bit 13 what? Range error for what? Warning, draw sprites, draw sprites, a little bit, that is 13. Why is this a, am I using this wrong? I'm probably using it wrong. Still, still have this problem. Um, oh, right, because that should be a pointer to the thing. All right, so I, What I want to do is I want to use X for that, but let me see if um, uh, six five five two offcodes. I don't remember how these offsets work half the time, so let's take a look. Um, yeah, let's indirect with Y. Just want to do an okay, absolute with Y. That's all I wanted to do. Okay, so the parentheses is really the issue. Um, think yeah um, because really I just want to increment um, past the address of that label for those bytes 
So, well, let's uh, get ready. Let's be prepared for for some nonsense here. Let's see how how awful this is. I expect the enemies to go flying off the screen and do weird things and crash the game, but who knows? We might be surprised and find that I actually managed to do something partially right. No. All right, well, so it didn't... Well, let me relaunch this. I don't feel confident that it actually reloaded the ROM. Let me just... Let's just double-check that, because that seemed... Too... That, that was highly suspect, that it did nothing. <laughs> okay. So... That was kind of more of what I was expecting. <laughs> um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so let's let's re let's re let's reevaluate this with um, with the emulation slowed down a little bit because um, it's too hard to know exactly. I think I know what happened. I think it's adding too much or something, and so it's kind of going crazy here. Um, but you see, I, 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 I knew myself well enough to know that this was going to potentially be totally disastrous. Um, yes, I can. I, it looks like it's just basically just adding... Um, too much to it or something um let's let's walk through this um so we have byte here that's zero we we might be having a scenario where we're we're overflowing something potentially maybe i don't know um so we load the X velocity. Let's, you know, let's check that first because that was a pretty wild assumption to make, to be honest. Um, there, I believe it will be zero, but maybe that's what the problem is and that's why it's not working. So let's restart. <clears throat> Come on. Oh, I have the, I didn't realize I still have the emulation running at super duper slow speed. All right, so once we get to the point where we have an enemy on screen. Okay, yeah, see, so it didn't trigger that right away which is problematic um so branch not equal so we loaded the x velocity of the object did we do something with the x velocity Load any auxiliary data. We do with the Y velocity. I don't see anything with the X velocity there. So if we go to add map object, it stores this stuff. Let's do this. Let's be a little proactive and store that in there. We probably could do it in other spots, like the data and data plus one. I don't know that we... Actually, we don't want to do that because it does try to read extra stuff after this, so that's unnecessary. It's just it's kind of a waste of cycles because they're, they're going to get overwritten with zeros later from whatever gets written by the export. So let's... Um, yeah, let's... Uh, See how that goes now. 
let's also make sure we've got the breakpoint in the right place. I mean, that should that breakpoint should hit as soon as we Yes. Okay, so that that's better. It hit as soon as the enemy spawned, which is what <clears throat> I expected it to do. So now it's going to load the X position and then it's going to store it in the X velocity, <clears throat> which we're repurposing here. And then the timer. All right. So the timer actually is zero. That's okay. Well, that's what we want. So then it's going to load A with the value zero. So let's, let's step through this um, here. So the next time through, timer should be one. Oh, why is the timer two? Something else is incrementing the timer? Okay. Well, regardless, uh, that would mean what? What did we... Oh, that's okay. So the movement is now seven, which is this one. Oh, you know what we're also not doing? Ah, oh, dummy. Um, we're also not doing the modulus that I wanted it to do, um, which is critically important. So once that's done, we need to load A with the timer and uh, and it with um, 16 because we only want to get values of 0 to uh, 15, not um, 16, sorry, 15. Um, so yeah, so F. Um, I reversed my bits in my brain um, and then store that back into Also, I'm not using the X index. That's a problem too. Okay, so we load the timer, we end it so that we only get values from zero to 15 and then we store it back and we're good and we've got our increment. Uh, load Y, uh, is that increment using the right thing? Load A. Virtual reunions with old friends on stream. <laughs> it's funny, I haven't talked to her in quite a while. So it was nice to see her pop into the stream. Okay, so load Y with zero. Load the value and then we do our add and everything's good there. And then the timer still mysteriously two for some reason but we get a value of seven okay that's so four it's like it's being double incremented somehow i don't know uh I'm, hold on, what am I looking at here? We do our add with carry and we store it and then we increment the timer and we load the timer. Why? That seems wrong. Seems like it's, it's not, it's not that the game is not maybe not working correctly, but more so that the debugger is is misbehaving. Um, all right, so you keep running, you do that. 
load that. Go to this thing. There's the breakpoint. It looks like something else is incrementing the timer outside of this loop, which is fine-ish. It's not right, but I'm less concerned with that. Okay, that looks more like what I expected. Um, oh, okay, it's two. Oh, okay, no, the timer is okay now. Um, something must have been messed up with the... Something must have been messed up with the, the way that it was reading the ROM or something when I reloaded it. Okay, well, there you go. So you can see um, we have a very poorly uh, implemented um, cycle going there, and they are close enough to the left side. That's weird. Why are they so close to the left side like that? Um, let's close the debugger here for a second. <clears throat> They're way closer to the side. Probably something I messed up in the logic with the x value and the x position. So let's let's look at this for a second. If we load the x velocity in zero, then we're gonna come into here. Wait, is that right? Branch not equal. If it's equal, it would be zero. Um, if we load it in zero, then this would branch to this. No. Yeah, that's... Did I reverse that? I think I just reversed that. If we get zero, then this is the condition that's true, and then we do that. Okay. We store that. Otherwise, if it's non-zero, then we we just want to store it back in the... Yeah, I just reversed that condition. That's got to be all it is, because it's late. I'm getting tired. And that would also make sense why the X position is getting forced over to zero. Okay. So that's not terrible. Uh, it's not great, but it's not terrible. And part of what's happening is, you know, the timer is um, incrementing once per cycle. So it's cycling through all 16 of those positions. Um, let's see. So if it's doing... If, it, if we're running at 60 frames per second and it's 16, was that three? So it cycles through that those those that sine wave uh, with a frequency of of three times three hertz, three times per second, right? So we want to slow that down, um, and the way we would slow that down is we would not cycle the timer quite so quick. Um, now the timer is a byte. We could cheat and use, let's see. Um, looks like we're using data plus one for the grouping. So that's for the part where if you have a bunch of um, a bunch of enemies spawn like this, we're keeping track of how many you actually how many are still alive. Um, I can't remember. Is that a separate? 
I think it is. I think it's a separate thing from how many are how many are still active versus how many were destroyed by the player. I'm pretty sure that's in the parent entity because once all of these are no longer active, then um, it despawns the parent entity so that we don't have to track that anymore. So uh, let's see, so we could use data and basically what we're gonna do is similar to the timer, instead of incrementing the timer, what we're gonna do is we're gonna increment data um, but then we're gonna load uh, we're gonna load that and I don't know um, compare it to we'll say we want to do one cycle every every second so every 60 frames so um, that means that in 60 frames we want to we want to divide 60 into well let's so three. Um, so, th I just did that. So, uh, wait a minute. If we wanted to have that happen, every, so every three frames we're going to increment. So 16 times three. Yeah. Okay. So, um, if, if we compare it to three, branch if not equal to here, otherwise we're going to increment. Right, we'll just increment the timer at that point. So increment data, load data, compare to three, branch if not equal. Um, to that, um, And what we can actually do there is the same thing. We can compare that against three. So we only ever get the value zero, one, or two. And then we still wanna compare the timer against or we still want to do our modulo against the timer as well because we're doing that to cycle through those values. Well, we'll see. I think that's right too. Unexpected trailing garbage characters. Branch, not... Oh, yeah. Gotta tell it where to actually branch to. All right, so. Now, this is probably going to show some of the weaknesses of the lower sampling. Yeah, so you can see, I mean, that effectively did what we wanted, but it didn't look nearly as smooth as uh, what we, you know, what we effectively want but that said we'd probably be okay whoa hold on come back here you guys we'd probably be okay if we maybe doubled our our sampling rate it's still too fast um so we had 32 points instead of 16 because it's not terrible like i'm not I'm not opposed to, I'm not opposed to that um, too much. It's just, you know, it's slow enough that you can sort of see the chunkiness of it. You can see the, the, the crisp motion, which should appear smooth. Um, you can see them jumping as they, as we iterate through our, our sine wave. And so the only way to really fix that is to add some more points to offset. I actually like, I didn't really consider that, but I really like that their offset, their their timing cycle is off uh, based on their spawn. And so you get them alternating in that pattern from one another. That's actually pretty cool. Um, 
Yeah. So one problem we could run into, well, I guess it doesn't matter because we're not using negative values that are big enough to, so if we, if we decided to go with a magnitude that was, um, that was too big, uh, because the negative values of an 8-bit uh, integer can only be negative 127 to 128, or negative 128 to 127, I don't remember, it's one of those. Um, if we had a value that was too large, that would potentially be a problem, um, both um, in terms of representing that for... Uh, for use and also for potentially getting the sprite to cycle back and forth off and on the edge again. Um, yes, you could do a comparing clamp. Yes. Um, but I mean, at the same time, I, you know, I don't expect us to go that far um, with the... Um, with the magnitude, I'm I'm okay. I mean, we maybe we will. I don't know. I'm okay with it being um, relatively a, a relatively tight um, cycle right now. Um, but we'll see. Um, again, I'm not I'm not totally dissatisfied with that because we accomplished the motion we were looking for. It's just I gotta you know add more pre-computed positions to to use for that for that motion to make it a little bit more smooth um but that's it i think uh i'll wrap here i've been streaming for almost two hours so um as always thank you for watching if you want to reach me on twitter i'm at clarvis i'm on nin uh, video game sage as zelius you can reach me um through email as zelius at gmail.com yes it's been almost two hours and like i said that that comes from our little tangents and side discussions so for anybody who who's watching this on youtube sorry that there's a whole little side discussion on the pandemic i'm sure you're all sick of hearing it um but uh yeah other than that i will continue to be doing these live streams and recordings you can support my efforts on patreon or buy me a coffee if you are so inclined oh don't be sorry about those tangents some people really like tangents so it's all fine that's totally unnecessary for you to do um the patreon and uh buy me a coffee are just things that i've put in place in case you feel so inclined um just because people have asked um but you can also pre-order the game which gets you access to the source code that i am working on here um and all of that is linked in the description below the video so um thank you for those who tuned in tonight live and uh, thank you for those who continue to watch uh on youtube and have a great night and take care <laughs>